Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellie Rose, and I'm so excited to welcome you all to Crash Course Fundamentals of Epidemiology, or Fun Epi. Uh, I've loved epidemiology for <laughs> quite a long time, so I'm excited to share some fun things about it with you all. So, as we all are living through COVID-19, we probably have some of an idea of what epidemiology is and what epidemiologists do. But just so we're all on the same page, epidemiology is quite literally translated to the study of what is upon the people. And so they study the distribution of health-related states like illness or the determinants of them. And they also apply this to control public health problems. So one thing epidemiologists deal with a lot is trying to define the extent of a disease. So this is basically how you can see which diseases are maybe bigger priorities than others. So one thing you might look at is a long-term or secular trend, which is gradual changes in the occurrence over time. For example, we see that AIDS deaths are decreasing over time. So we can say that the extent is shrinking. You also have cyclic changes, which are basically really recurrent alteration from the frequency of outcome. So this is a really common case in something like influenza, where we see this spike every winter and we expect it to spike every winter. Uh, whereas if we saw it at winter numbers in the summer, it might show us that there's a little more of a problem we should look into. There's also a term that we use a lot called endemic, which is when a disease is just constantly present in a certain geographic area area and we expect to see it, or we expect to see it to a certain number in a geographical area. So for example, uh, malaria in Brazil is pretty normal. However, you're going to get a lot of eyebrows raised if malaria starts showing up in Canada. Another example of this is, let's say in Missouri, the endemic level of salmonella infection is defined as five per year. But all of a sudden you get 10 in a week that is a good indicator that there's a problem going on. So the term epidemic occurs to when cases of a certain illness rise above endemic levels. And a pandemic is what we're all living through now, which is when this occurs worldwide. Now, two terms that are really important for you to get a hang of is incidence and prevalence. And the way I think of it Incidence is what I check every day on the New York Times website, COVID dashboard, because as you can see, they tell me every day, new cases and new deaths. They don't tell me how many people actively have COVID. They tell me how many people were diagnosed with COVID yesterday. And so incidence is new cases of the disease over the number of people at risk. So that's an important thing to consider because for example, when you're looking at the incidence of ovarian cancer, you might wanna exclude men from that denominator because they can't get ovarian cancer. Uh, secondly, incidence rate is a really similar statistic. And this is used when you're trying to measure incidence in a population. Maybe it's for a study where you're like checking in on a multiple numbers of people, but you just lose track of certain people or they don't respond to you anymore. So in that case, you would use incidence rate and use the denominator, a thing called person time at risk. So for example, if you are able to keep in touch with someone for 11 months, but you lose them after that, you would assign that person 11 person months. And then you would add up all the person months you have for your subjects, and that would be your person time at risk. Lastly, prevalence is the number of people that actively have a disease at a given time. So you're gonna see this a lot with like maybe statistics like, oh, one in three Americans lives with a mental illness. They're not saying that one in three Americans is diagnosed every day, but they're saying that one in three Americans actively has them. Another important thing when we're looking at all these statistics is age adjustment, because you can probably even intuitively understand that older people are more likely to get sick so it sometimes isn't fair to compare a very young population with a very old population and just call the young population healthier. Uh, we see this a lot in the fact that 
nursing homes were more likely to have COVID-19 outbreaks because it's a lot of older individuals that are immunocompromised. So direct age adjustment is one method of doing this. And this is going to compare uh, you know, population X and population Y by creating a standard population. And that's usually just the sum of both populations. And then you would calculate the rates for each population overall, the standard population by age specific rates, sum the expected number of events, and then divide that by the total to attain an age adjusted rate. An indirect age adjustment is when you don't really know the number of age specific deaths for a distribution, but you can still calculate the standardized mortality ratio, which is the number of deaths you would ex expect over the number of deaths you observed. And so this will kind of tell you if you're seeing way more deaths than usual or way less deaths than usual in this age bracket. Some other things you can do include the life table method, and this is going to determine pattern of survival in certain populations. And so your data is examined at time intervals, and you can see that even if you don't have all the data on people that just started treatment, you can still use them. And then calculate the cumulative probability of surviving for one, two, three, four, five years. One important assumption you're going to make when you use life tables is that there haven't been any major changes to treatment over the course of the study. So for example, uh, the study started in 2010. There's no life-saving drug that entered the market in 2012. One of my favorite methods, just because I use this in my research and not even epidemiology research, I use this for like infection models, is the Kaplan-Meier method which is where you kind of have this curve. And as you can see, every time there's like a death, the curve is like a little stair step. And so um, if then you can calculate the probability of an event at any given time and estimate the cumulative incidence of the event by using one minus the Kaplan-Meier. One of the coolest things that epidemiologists do is they perform outbreak investigations. And so again, this is more of a case with outbreaks and not epidemics or pandemics. It's a little more difficult at this point to find the patient zero for COVID-19, for example. But a really good example of this would be like a foodborne illness. Like possibly one of my favorite stories is that of an E. coli outbreak. And so your step one would be to de determine the existence of an epidemic. And possibly this is through surveillance, you're recording more cases than you would expect. And then you would want to develop something called a case definition, which is a really specific who, what, when, where, why. So um, what type of illness is it? It's E. coli. Uh, where did it happen? Uh, if you're trying to investigate an E. coli outbreak in Missouri, you might not want to see any cases from Canada. Uh, when did symptoms occur? You might not want to see someone that got E. coli two years ago. And then you would try to find as many of people that fit that case definition as possible and survey them for any potential exposures they went, they had, any places they went to, or any demographics. And from that, you can create something like this table we see, you know, who ate the tuna salad and who ate the um, egg salad. You can see who's sick, who's not, and the attack rate. And eventually you can find a risk ratio. So one really fun example of this that I've seen is this one investigation of E. coli and they could not find out for the life of them what was causing it. They had linked it back to a Mexican restaurant, but everyone had ordered different things. It took them a while, but they eventually determined that everyone had consumed the free chips and salsa at the table, which they had forgotten about. And so the outbreak was linked back to the cilantro and the salsa. And one thing, once you have this hypothesis, is you would collect specimens for lab analysis to confirm this hypothesis. So. They took the cilantro to the lab, it tested positive for E. coli, and that was that. Several different types of outbreaks. So there's one called a common source outbreak, 
which is where people are exposed to an agent or toxin from one single source. Uh, there is point source outbreak, which is a type of this where you're exposed at a single point in time. For example, after Hiroshima, there was an excess of leukemia cases. There are also continuous outbreaks, which is where exposure is going to occur over a longer period of time. You see this maybe if a water plant is contaminated, such as in Flint, Michigan, unfortunately. You also see propagated outbreaks, which is where there is person-to-person -person transmission of a disease. There's also something called mixed outbreaks, which is a mix of the two. Some epidemics might have a common source patient zero, but then they might be propagated. Another concept that's important for you to understand and that you probably hear a lot about in the news is the concept of herd immunity. And this is basically when not everyone is immune to a disease, but there are so many people immune to a disease that it just doesn't have any leg room anymore. And it kind of goes away in that group of people. So as you can see, um, this is really interesting uh, graph about the effect of the polio vaccine. So this was the expected number of cases if just people that were vaccinated were immune. But as you can see, the cases are much lower and this is because of herd immunity. So other ways we can kind of figure out what's going on is we can perform surveillance, which is how we kind of determine how many cases we have of each disease. There's something called passive surveillance, which is basically where public health agencies will mandate reporting of disease cases that a physician sees. And this is really common when you're performing surveillance for diseases that are really strong public interest, like COVID-19, or something extremely deadly or contagious, like measles, or possibly like creutzfeldt jakob disease is this really deadly prion disease. So if you ever have a free weekend, I highly recommend the National Notifiable Disease Surveillance System, because that's just a really fun site where you can look at all that data and see what's going on. You can also perform active surveillance, which is basically a special search for cases. And this is like literally or figuratively door to door collection. We also have sentinel surveillance, which instead of mandated reporting is voluntary. This is used for studies sometimes. And then you have something really cool called syndromic surveillance. And so this is gonna use really untraditional indicators of disease because for something like passive surveillance, a case is reported when there's a diagnosis made. But syndromic surveillance kind of goes a few days before that. So you kind of look at what is called pre-diagnostic indicators, like uh, being out of school, posting on Twitter that you're not feeling really good, maybe uh, internet-based health searches. So for example, here you can see that the Googling of the flu is concurrent with rises in flu cases. And this is really cool because then you can detect the presence of diseases likely a few days before this person is able to get to a doctor and get a diagnosis, because we all know that that can take forever. Another important concept that we are all familiar with here at Johns Hopkins is testing. You get tested a lot, and it does a lot for epidemiologists to collect their data. We have to make sure that tests are both reliable and valid. So tests um, have to be sensitive which means that people should be correctly identified as positive. They also have to be specific. Those that don't have the disease are negative. And depending on what kind of disease we're trying to detect, we might want to avoid false positives or false negatives more. So you want, want to avoid false positives if the disease is really stigmatizing, like AIDS, or if the treatment is really invasive, like cancer. In that case, you would perform sequential testing which is where you retest people who test positive the first time with the second, more expensive test. So one downside is you might have a little more false negatives. And if you wanna avoid false negatives, which you might wanna do if you have a treatment, but it really, you like have to use it now. For example, rabies, if you don't get treated in a certain period of time, you're likely going to succumb to the disease. In that case, you really wanna make sure you're right if you, if the test comes back negative. So then you would do two simultaneous tests, 
which is where a person who tests positive on either test will be labeled as positive. Two other concepts that are important to understand is positive predictive value and negative predictive value, PPV and NPV. And so PPV is the proportion of those who have the disease that test positive over the total people that test positive. And the same with NPV. One important thing for these two things is that this is not a fixed characteristic of the test. Sensitivity and specificity are fixed characteristics of the test. They don't change depending on who's getting it. However, in more in populations with higher prevalence of the disease, PPV is going to be higher and NPV is going to be lower. One good analogy for this is if you had a general practice physician, you had some specialist that dealt with appendicitis. The general practice physician might talk like, oh, you have a stomach ache? Oh, I've seen that all the time. It's really rarely actually appendicitis. It's usually something else. I see lots of stomach aches. But the appendicitis physician who only sees people that have appendicitis it's going to be like every patient I see with stomach pain has appendicitis. And it's not necessarily a cognitive distortion. It's just the fact that it's more prevalent with this doctor. So the two things are linked a little more. Another thing we deal with with tests is reliability. And this is the degree to which the results can be replicated. This is really common. Maybe a test where you have to have a human interpret it. And so you want to make sure that between two different humans, you're getting similar results. And in that case, you would calculate the kappa statistic, which is a measure of a degree of non-random agreement between observers. Next, we're going to be talking about epidemiologic study designs. And so this is a really big cornerstone of epidemiology because you're basically doing these studies to try and determine if X causes Y. So for example, does smoking cause cancer? Does wearing a mask prevent COVID-19 infection? So there are a lot of different ways that you can perform a study. Here are some of the ones we're gonna be talking about. One of the easiest ways to do this is an ecologic study, which is where instead of surveying individuals, you're going to be looking at groups and group statistics. So uh, one example of this is, uh, you hear this a lot that like French people don't have a lot of heart disease, even though they on average eat a lot of saturated fat. So that's kind of like an ecologic study because you're not looking at individual French people and their fat intake, you're just kind of generalizing it to the whole population. And even though um, this is really convenient, like you can use a lot of available data to do these studies, they do have this key limitation known as the ecologic fallacy, which is basically the fact that, again, a group measurement is not going to be similar to an individual measurement. And so you can't really ascribe group characteristics to individual members of the group. What is known as the gold standard of epidemiology is the randomized control trial. This is a control study that basically prospectively evaluates the effect of a certain exposure. Usually it's a medication on an outcome. And so this is where you follow participants over time. You break them into two groups. One person is getting placebo, one group is getting the treatment, and then you see whether or not they have the outcome of interest. It might be uh, death from cancer. It might be cases of flu. It just depends. One important thing you want to make sure you do in these trials is you randomize your sample. So anyone is equally likely to be in the control group or the exposure group. Uh, you want to make sure also to do this to prevent something called confounding by indication. And this is where, um, you know, people that are more sick and have more difficult diseases might be more likely to enroll in a clinical trial because they have exhausted other treatment options. And so they might be more likely to join the exposure group. And that means that the exposure is less likely to work because they're already not doing well. 
Another important thing you want to make sure you're doing is masking, which is where you make sure that the participants don't know what they're getting. This is to prevent bias. And one thing with dealing with humans, as we all know, humans don't always do what you ask them. So if some people aren't going to take the medication you tell them to take. They're going to go out and find their own medication. They're going to do something differently, and this might mess up your results. In general, we like to use the intention to treat approach, which is where we just analyze it based on how they were originally randomized, regardless of if they actually did what we asked them to do. We can also do it per protocol result, um, which is like analyzing it in a way that excludes all the non-compliant people. So there's a lot of advantages of clinical trials. They are the gold standard of epidemiology studies and they minimize bias. They can establish that X came before Y, like a temporal sequence. However, they are very costly and they take a long time. Another type of clinical trial is the crossover trial, which is basically where each participant can serve as their own control. So let's say I'm gonna test the results of two different drugs at once. You can basically do that by um, having them take drug A, then you have like a washout period, and then they take drug B and they see which one makes them better. When you're doing data analysis of RCTs, you want to use a measure called relative risk, which is the cumulative incidence among the exposed divided by that among the unexposed. An example of this going on right now at Johns Hopkins, or example of a clinical trial that you might have seen in the news is the clinical trial for convalescent plasma for COVID-19, where they basically are trying to determine whether or not this is effective. Another type of study design is a cohort study. This is where you follow individuals over time as well. And so basically at study entry, the participants don't really have anything you're looking for, any diseases, but you're gonna ask them about their exposures, their habits. For example, do you smoke? And then you're gonna follow each group over time to see are the smokers getting more disease than the non-smokers or is this not the case? And so you can have prospective cohort studies, which is typically what you would think of when you think of a cohort study, which is where you group them at baseline and follow them through time. We also have retrospective studies, which is kind of where data collection might have already occurred just through historical records and you look back on them and analyze them like you would a cohort study. This is really efficient for rare exposures because you're recruiting people based on exposure. And you can evaluate the multiple effects of an exposure. And this is really efficient for diseases that take a long time to develop if you have a retrospective design. However, you are gonna to have to do with losses of people to follow up. And this isn't very efficient for rare outcomes either. It's a little bit expensive and it's just hard to keep in touch with people. In this case, you would also use relative risk. A case control study is kind of like the opposite of a cohort study. And this is where you're gonna collect participants that already have the outcome. And then you're gonna ask them about their exposure in the past. And so you can do this based on a certain population. For example, you might wanna look at a COVID-19 hospital wing and ask them all if they had been vaccinated. Or you can do this nested, which is you put it this in an ongoing study. Important thing to note is that cases are selected independently of exposure status. So back to the, um, COVID-19 ward of a hospital, you're not going to recruit people that are unvaccinated. You're going to recruit anyone that has COVID-19 in the hospital. You can also do something called matching to make sure that your controls and your cases are similar, because that is one thing you want to consider. So you have group matching, which, which is where the proportion of controls with certain characteristics are identical to the proportion of cases. And you have individual matching, which is where maybe for each person you interview, you might say something like, oh, do you have like a sibling or a friend that's really similar to you that I could also call? And they would give you this friend, this friend would not have the illness and you could, you know, collect data based on that. One thing that's important is once you match 
controls to cases, you can't really study that characteristic in your analysis. For example, if you're already fixing the proportion of males and females that can be in the study, you can't study the effect of gender because you're kind of controlling how much gender you see. It's really cool. Um, the study is really cool because it's really efficient. Um, it doesn't take a lot of time. Again, it's one kind of survey point. It's good for rare diseases or diseases that take a long time to develop. However, it is hard to find rare exposures or temporal relationships sometimes. Cross-sectional studies are really, really quick and low cost. Uh, this is kind of the classic example would be like if someone called you on the phone and asked you to take a survey real quick. So basically there's data collection at a single point in time on exposures and outcomes and other factors. And so it's just a snapshot. Um, the one thing is you can't really establish any temporality if someone is telling you at the same time that they smoke and they have cancer, you can't really determine which one came first. Also, depending on what population you're using, some cross-sectional studies encounter bias from the healthy worker effect, which is basically from the fact that if you're employed and you're working, you're likely going to be healthier than someone who is retired due to their health. Maybe they are disabled and they can't work traditionally. So this might happen if you're surveying a group of workers, they might be healthier than the general population. And for this one, you would use prevalence ratio. And just to clarify, case control study would use odds ratio for your data. There's some other measures of association you can use in your data analysis, uh, like attributable risk. And this is important because policymakers might ask, you know, are we going to eliminate cancer entirely if we get rid of smoking? That's not really the case, but you can kind of approximate how much cancer you would eliminate. <laughs> how much cancer you would eliminate if you eliminated smoking. Another important thing to consider is the factor of causation. So there are many factors that we use to really determine that X causes Y. Um, that smoking causes cancer that radiation causes sterility. Um, so we have necessary causes, which are causes that always must proceed in effect, but they aren't necessarily going to cause the disease. For example, um, being a woman is a necessary cause of ovarian cancer because a man cannot get ovarian cancer. He does not have ovaries. <laughs> But again, if you are a woman, it doesn't mean that you are automatically going to get ovarian cancer. Uh, on the other hand, a sufficient cause is a cause that is going to always produce an effect. Now, if you think about this, this is actually a little bit rare to think of something that will always cause a disease in every instance. But one example that is good is like, we pretty much know that high dose radiation is going to guarantee development of sterility in men. And so any cause, can be necessary, sufficient, both or neither. And again, when we're looking at these causes, we have a lot of factors we wanna consider. One that is really the most important and really, really just necessary is a temporal sequence. And this means that we know that the exposure comes before the outcome. Someone, um, I'm gonna just go on the smoking and cancer train here. We would know that smoking doesn't cause cancer if people got cancer and then they started smoking, but they always start smoking before they get cancer. And so a clinical trial, a cohort study, and some case control studies can establish temporality, but some of them cannot. We also can look at the strength of the association, which is what we are looking at with our epidemiologic studies relative risks, odds ratios, treatable risk. The stronger these associations, the better the case for a cause. You can also look at dose response relationship. Does risk for disease increase with the degree of exposure? So for example, does 
risk for cancer increase the more cigarettes you smoke. We also have to consider if these results have been consistently observed, if they make sense biologically. Um, we also have a measure called specificity of association, which is not really used anymore because it's not valid. But basically, it says that smoking can only cause cancer and it can't also cause teeth decay or X or Y. But we know that exposures can cause multiple diseases. We can't really do human experiments, but there are kind of semi-experimental ways to determine causation. And for example, this is shown when exposure is eliminated, does the risk of disease decrease? We can also just use populations that were naturally exposed that we did not initiate. For example, the Dutch famine study exhibited or examined the effects of a famine on a population. The researchers did not cause the famine. They just took advantage of the famine to study it. There's also analogy, which is where you ask, is there evidence from another area that this could cause that? And so for example, we know that thalidomide causes birth defects during pregnancy. And so we may therefore more readily think that another drug might cause birth defects during pregnancy. We also have to consider some alternate explanations for our study findings, uh, such as chance, bias, and confounding. Oh, look, chance, bias, and confounding. These are basically reasons that your study may not be correct, or your measure of association may be skewed. So first off, we have bias. A lot of different types of bias, but one is like information bias, which is where you're analyzing the data incorrectly. Maybe the guy interpreting your COVID-19 tests is really excited and wants to label them all as negative just because he's so sure that his thing is going to work. There's misclassification. It can be um, different in cases and controls or not. Uh, there's a lot of recall bias where people might recall their exposures differently. Uh, interviewers might ask participants different things depending on who they are. Selection bias is where your groups are incorrect. Uh, basically, you're trying to explain this. Good. Basically, there are really systematic differences in people that take part in the study and people that don't. And so it's not really representative of the general population. One example of this outside of epidemiology is in like the 1930s. I think this one magazine had predicted that Herbert Hoover was going to win the presidential election uh, because they surveyed all of their subscribers. Uh, we know that FDR won that election like, by like a landslide. And so they're wondering what they had done wrong. And they realized that they surveyed people based on like car records and car owners, and it was the Great Depression, so no one really owned a car. And so that was kind of a bias that distorted their true predictions. One thing to note is that even if you analyze the data really well, you can't correct for bias in the data analysis phase. There's also chance, which is just random error, and you would quantify that using a p-value. If a p-value is less than 0 0.05, it usually rules out chance in producing the observed result. And so you're gonna see this a lot in scientific papers where like everyone wants that p-value below 0 0.05. And it's crazy. <laughs> I know in my lab, we like freak out and we see one of those values, and, but it's very nice to have. Confounding is basically going to be when the measure of association is distorted because there's this relationship between the exposure and a third factor that is also going to influence the outcome. So one example of this is if someone were to say, you know, every time I go to bed with my shoes on, I have a headache in the morning. I must be allergic to my shoes. And then they ignore the fact that they only go to bed with their shoes on when they're really drunk and they forget to take them off. It's likely that your headache is being caused by the alcohol 
and not necessarily going to bed with your shoes on. And so you can control for confounding in the study design and in the data analysis. There's also effect modification, which is different from confounding. This is when the size of an association is changed or modified by a third variable. And so one example of this is we know that smoking causes cancer. We know if you smoke and you're exposed to asbestos, you're likely even more susceptible to getting cancer. This is modifying the effect of smoking on health outcomes. And so you can kind of look for evidence of this by looking at the crude and stratum specific measures of association. And you can also use additive versus multiplicative effects on a population. Some things to keep in mind is if you're looking at incidence estimates and it's greater than you would expect, either additively or multiplicatively, you're gonna have synergism. And if it's less, then you would have antagonism. All right, that is it for today. Thank you all so much for joining me. Please stay safe, do well on your tests, and I beg of you, wash your hands. <laughs> all right, thanks guys, goodbye.